Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Vision 2030. And those of you who have just joined us, my name is Anam Chowdhury and I'm uh, joined by Muhammad Ali, who is an internationally renowned artist. Also Simon uh, Mia, who is an architectural designer. And also we have a special guest here today. Uh, her name is Nasrin Atta. Uh, she is uh, a Birmingham, she's works, she works with Birmingham City uh, University and currently a PhD student uh, at the University of Birmingham. Uh, Nasrin, you have won uh, Princess uh, Badia Mentor of the uh, Mentor of the Year Award in 2016, and uh, an international, uh, which is an international internationally recognised prestigious award. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for coming and joining in with us today. Uh, so, Nazreen, I want to start with you uh, in this segment. Um, obviously. Um, this award that you have won is uh, it's an it must have been an incredibly competitive um, uh, award, uh, as any. I mean, tell me about it. I mean, how did you? Uh, what inspired you to go for the award? Tell me some his history about this uh, particular award. Um, well, I didn't even know that okay. I was shortlisted for the award. Mm -hmm. um, the Princess Badia Mentor of the Year Award. It's um, the highest award you can achieve, okay. um, or be awarded rather, from the Mosaic Network, mm -hmm. which is a national charity that delivers mentoring programs in some of the most deprived parts of the UK. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, recently become part of the Prince's Trust. Okay. Um, in terms of the process of winning the award, um, you have to be selected for Hero of the Month, mm -hmm. and that in itself is competitive because it's nationally, and there's about 2,000 mentors that mentor okay. for the charity. So to be selected for that, that was phenomenal for me. Um, at the same time of being, uh, being awarded Hero of the Month, I also won um, the Highly Commended Award for twice in a row. Okay. So that again, that was more than enough for me. Okay. Um, and then I was informed that because I won Hero of the Month, I was shortlisted for the Regional Mentor of the Year Award and there was three of us. And um, I, I won that. Again, I was not expecting it whatsoever. And um, then I realised there was five regional mentor, mentors of the year from across the UK that were shortlisted for the Princess Padilla Award. Um, for me, it was never about winning awards. I love mentoring. I love volunteering with the Mosaic Network. Um, I'm currently volunteering on a primary school mentoring programme. This is my 13th program over oh, the course of four and a half years. I absolutely enjoy it, so passionate about it, and my PhD is all about it as well. Okay. So winning awards was just not expected. I don't, I don't, it's weird to say this, but it always feel, it feels a bit weird for me to win awards for something that I enjoy doing. Okay. It's almost like winning an award for being yourself. So you, you were passionate about working, so, uh, volunteering in the community, yeah, yeah. helping, uh, supporting the people. Yeah. So who inspired you to um, take up that uh, community um, support career, let's say? Who, um, who was your inspiration? It was my mom mainly, because she always said, you have to give back. You mm -hmm. know, whatever Allah gives you, mm -hmm. it's to give back to others, to share um, your knowledge, your expertise, whatever it is. And my dad struggled throughout his life. I mean, mm -hmm. he left education very early on just so he could earn a living. Mm -hmm. um, just seeing my parents struggle because they lost out on educational opportunities, that motivated me. Hence, I've got to the stage where I'm a PhD student. Mm -hmm. But I've always wanted to give back to the local community because it's where I've come from, it's where I've grown up, and it upsets me that the communities that I've grown up in, mm -hmm. they're classed as deprived, and a lot of the students living in that area, they're not doing so well. Mm -hmm. So I feel if I can go back to the schools and show them, well, look, I'm from the exact same background as you. My dad's in the same job as your dad. Look where I am. Mm -hmm. So you can do better. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and that is truly uh, an inspiration for uh, all of us. Um, so, Mohammed, I'm coming to you now. Um, you currently, uh, you are currently leading on uh, Knights of the Raj program, mm -hmm. and uh, you were exploring, like, as I said earlier, you were exploring the history and the heritage of uh, the British curry industry. Um, what I want to know from you: What are the second generation um, uh, young people whose lives were revolved around uh, working within the restaurants? What are they saying to you? Um, what's the message from them? Uh, what are you hearing from them? Well, look, I mean. I, I you speak about second generation. I mean, I'm I'm one I'm one of those mm -hmm. who, you know, his parents, um, much like Naz what Naz we mentioned, mm -hmm. our parents made many sacrifices for, okay. uh, and the restaurant trade is what they they did right. What they did was was transform what we know as as kind of uh, uh, 
the national cuisine of this country mm -hmm. Uh, was transformed by the efforts of these immigrants that came from Silla and most largely Silla from Bangladesh. Oh, indeed. And I mean, myself, I mean, I've been working, helping my dad in when he was alive uh, in the restaurant since I was 11 years old. A lot of those generations, of course, have, you know, didn't want to take on a business. And as we know, mm -hmm. there is a crisis in this industry right now mm -hmm. in terms of staffing problems, etc. And the, these generations of, of, of young people are saying, well, that's not the path I choose to take. I want to go on to do X, Y and Z. And I was one of those, certainly. Um, so what I'm finding is with this project that we've embarked on, the Knights of the Raj, it's a heritage archives project. Now, one might hear that and say, what the hell is a heritage and arch what, are you, what are, even are the archives, mm -hmm. for God's sake? Well, you know, what, what does that matter to me? Why am I exploring this heritage? Why am I even on this show mm -hmm. talking about this project, which I believe passionately about? That the, I'm hoping that the British Bangladeshis of this country, which I'm keen to share this project with, it tells the very story of, of this community. Whether you worked in the industry or not, whether you rejected it or you chose not to take on the family business. It's a part of our life. It's a it part of been, who yeah. you are. It's yeah. part of where this community got here. Mm -hmm. This community is formed even in the, the most isolated towns across the country. You can go mm -hmm. into the mountains of Scotland and still find a Bangladeshi restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's because they, this is how the community is formed. They went out, families came over, communities grew. The restaurant trade was part and parcel of, of this community's kind of development, if you like. So these stories, the Knights of the Raj and this project I've embarked on, the archives and documenting the stories of that generation, the early generation who I say pioneered this industry, which then transformed this cuisine in this country, are largely unrecognized. Why? Because when we talk about Indian, the Indian, uh, uh, Indian cuisine in this country, probably uh, from last I heard it was 85% Mm -hmm. of it are actually not Indian Bang owned at yeah. all, they're Bangladeshi owned. Yeah. We know that, yes, but the, yeah. the, main, the people don't know, realize that. Mm -hmm. You speak to anybody and speak about Indian food and they say, well, what's the response? Bangla what? Where's that? Mm -hmm. Bangla, you're telling me Bangladesh and the people from that community, you know, define this whole sector. And they did, we know that, but we, we take it for granted in a way. And I always say that the biggest PR disaster that our community of Bangladeshi people ever made was that, that, that the yeah. fact of the matter is, we just said, oh, Indian cuisine lazily. Yeah. But the reality is, you got no credit for it. You mm -hmm. mentioned to, uh, to, to any community, what is the Bangladeshi community known for? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sorry, I know it's going to be a little bit hard to listen to this. You mentioned about the successes or the things that an Indian community might have contributed to. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, I'm not being anti-Indian or mm -hmm. anti-Pakistani when I say this. Mm -hmm. But their communities have you know, have been, you know, contributed and, and, and the Bangladeshi community has, but it hasn't been recognized for recognized, it. Yeah. India is known for many things. Pakistan, you know, has its various role models, whether it's cricketers or sports, you know, but Bangladesh, blank expressions on people's mm -hmm. faces. Mm -hmm. Or and even though we were the pioneers of the Korean Of this trade. Yeah, of this trade. That, that generation mm -hmm. who, who transformed this country's cuisine are, are slowly dying off. Mm -hmm. They are going and fading away. And what they're taking with them, mm -hmm. and this is the tragedy of it all, um, the tragedy is they're taking with them their stories, mm -hmm. their experiences. This is why when we talk about archives, what are archives? Archives generally we think about old documents that are in some, you know, some place stored somewhere in an underground, you know, basement or something in the city, in the city buildings, right? But those stories often tell the histories of a people that are basically everyone except us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reality is when we're talking about the mainstream, we're talking about white British, yeah? Their stories have been captured and been told and you could actually find out who your great great grandfather was and where he might have lived on such and such street but you want to track your heritage of who was my grandfather mm -hmm. we we've got nowhere to go and, and actually that's something that is so how can kind of problematic that's something that you know when you're disconnected from your past how are you supposed to move forward how are you supposed to understand who you are when you don't know where you came from, came from okay. right and you don't know the struggles and i say those struggles those stories that our parents would say, and I'll tell you, from like my father, when he was alive, we'd sit in the restaurant and he would say, he'll say to me, you know, talk about his struggles, about how they struggled. And at that age, when I'm 15, 14 years old, you weren't really listening. You were kind of like, okay, we've heard it all before. Actually, you know, we've, we don't really want to know. Only after you, when you realize, you see, you're, you're, you're craving to hear that story more, the struggles they went through 
and those stories are disappearing now. Who's archived them? Mm -hmm. Who's actually gone and interviewed all of our elder generation who are 70s, 80s, or are dying off now, sadly, before they die off and take those stories with them to the grave? Can we honor them, respect them, and give them the respect they deserve for us, i.e. people who have now gone into education, gone into architecture, won numerous awards. It was down to the curry, curry shop workers. Mm -hmm. Let's be brutally honest. Yes, the yes. curry shop workers who worked night and day, we hardly saw much of our parents because they said we want to sacrifice to give our kids the opportunities. The least we can do mm -hmm. is say we want to honor their legacy of what they did and, and our generations to come in 100, 200, 300 years time. I want so, our great grandchildren to be able to go to a city archive, mm -hmm. put on some headphones, or pick up a piece of paper, or pick up a, a black and white picture and say, that's the story and I want to know exactly what it was like mm -hmm. when they came here in racist Britain, 1960s, 1970s. So it can continue to motivate and tell stories to our young people in the future. Well, why yeah. is it that every community can have access to its history and its, and its foundation going back hundreds of years, mm -hmm. but we as a community, do we not have a right to do that? Yeah, of course. And what are the implications when you do and you are denied that? So it sounds a very interesting project, really. We will hear more about it. Um, Simon, um, I want to talk to you about the, uh, the challenges uh, of being a Bangladeshi young man uh, living in deprived areas. As you know, 28% of the Bangladeshi community live in some of the most deprived areas uh, in the country. Among those uh, in working, around 65% are in low-income families. So my question to you is, how much of living in deprived areas and uh, living in low-income families uh, influence the lives of our young people? I think um, there's two ways to think about this. I mean, for me, I actually did grow up in a low-income area. Mm -hmm. And my mother and father, my father was a foundry worker and my mother was a housewife. So we, we did have a low-income family. But um, I think the area you're in doesn't actually shape who you are. Oh, I right. think it's all got to do with um, your motivation and also your upbringing. So if your parents are pushing you towards achieving, succeeding, whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. I think that plays a bigger role into who and to develop you to who you are today. I mean, um, no, my people, um, my family, and my couple of my friends, you know, came from you know, let's say, not very good schools, but you know, a handful of them, at least ten percent of them, have achieved um, great things and have gone into education or have actually set up their own businesses. But then the other bunch are kind of left behind almost. But it's almost got to do with um, them not actually seeing themselves coming out of the little bubble or the little um, corner or the street they live on because they don't see the wider world. I mean, they see the, their life is living and dying in that role they were born in. Mm -hmm. But I think for them to actually develop is for them to actually see the world and actually introduce themselves to certain things like the Mosaic Project, mm -hmm. um, where they're actually taken out of their, let's say, the comfort zone and actually um, teaching others their skills and the things they know. So those people which didn't go into education like myself, um, they, you know, they have their certain skills in business, which okay. they, you know, it's all good and it's all good knowledge. Okay. So I think uh, ho um, thanks for that, Simon. We'll hear more, uh, more from you. We have a caller on the line, so let's take the call, please. And uh, so uh, what's your name, please, and where are you calling from, and what would you like to say? Hello, assalamu alaikum, brother. My name is Abdul Qayyum. Uh, I'm from London. I just want to add a little bit to the brother who said uh, about the Indian restaurant. Mm -hmm. So... Hello? Yes, yeah, carry on, we're hearing you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, about the Indian restaurant, because we Bangladesh is not getting credit for it, because mm. 50, 50 years we made the Indian restaurant. We didn't give the name Indian, I mean Bangladeshi. So mm. especially in major cities, even now, every restaurant is Indian. Nothing, nobody is hardly anybody the thing um, uh, Bangladeshi. So what I've done, I just... Not to advertise myself, but because you know, find that you're dealing with it. So I've just found out that um, even the first Indian restaurant was in Portman, near Portman Square, a uh, place called George, George Street, mm -hmm. number 32, or some, sometimes they say 102, uh, George Street in W1. Even the first Indian restaurant was found by a Bengali, a Muslim Bengali, Sheikh Muhammad. Sheikh Muhammad Din, you know, mm -hmm. Sheikh Din Muhammad. Yeah. So it, it, this thing goes back a long time that Bangladesh is not getting credit for it. And especially a few years ago, I was very upset in one of the, I think it was Sunrise Radio, they were talking. Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much for that uh, for that call. Um, and I think this is what we're talking about: That's is right. reviving our history That's right, yeah. in the sense that you know uh, we have been pioneers, but we haven't been That's recognised. Right. Right. We have another call on the line. So, um, uh, can we go to that call, please? What's your name and where are you calling from, please? My name is Amir Uddin. I'm calling from uh, East London. Oh, well, hello, Mr. Uddin. Uh, thank you for calling in uh, with us today. Uh, what would you like to say, please? I just wanted to compliment that gentleman who's talking about our heritage, okay. um, you know, the, the catering industry where um, uh, people not been recognized. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for that compliment. I think it's really encouraging. And this is where Muhammad is trying to revive that, the history of, of, of our curry industry. And I think most mm -hmm. importantly, there is a role for our young people of today uh, to play in the, in the revival of the industry. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. By, doing, by reviving the history sure. is an important fact. But also, we need to look at how our young people can uh, integrate into the business. But that's another discussion that we can have. Right. Um, now, I, wanna, uh, I, I want to ask, um, uh, Nazreen, Nazreen, we have uh, uh, very low employment among uh, Bangladeshi women uh, in our community. In fact, 58% of Bangladeshi women are not working. Um, uh, but uh, among the young people, they are more likely to study and also work. But I want to know from you what you think are the barriers, uh, especially for uh, young ladies within our community. And, and are these barriers uh, really hindering the progress? Um. Everything I say about this topic will be based on the primary school mentoring programs that okay. I've been part of, mm -hmm. um, because the mentoring programs are mothers and daughters mm -hmm. that we mentor. Um, the mothers that I've met, a lot of them mention that it's the lack of support mm -hmm. that sometimes hinders them. Um, the mothers that participate in these programs tend to be um, married with kids and maybe uh, missed out on education, maybe dropped out of education, maybe they've come to the UK some 10, 15 years ago and never quite picked up the British education um, process system, whatever. But um, from what I've heard, it's them being scared about going out and trying something new because they worry their family may not support them and this is all in their head you know they've not actually gone out and said to their husband or their um, in-laws will you support me so I'm not trying to say there's horrible in-laws out there but um, a lot of the mothers mentioned support um, being a main factor they also mentioned confidence mm -hmm. um, some of the mothers that I've mentored it's taken 10 weeks of mentoring for them to finally feel confident mm -hmm. to either enroll on an ESOL course okay. or um, take part in after school clubs for example dressmaking or baking or even Mendy classes and um, one mother she actually enrolled on um, a degree and she'd um, left her college study she studied in um, Pakistan I believe and after she finished college she ended up getting married, settling into the routine of a housewife. For her to go back to education, to become a paramedic, to give back to her community, that was amazing. Um, there's another mother who recently started taking driving lessons. Brilliant. And for me, I don't think it's a result of the 10 week mentoring program. I think it's a result of these ladies finding mentors such as myself okay. that believe in them and give them that support and that okay. push and that Brilliant. confidence. It's, it's, like you said, it's very important to have some sort of support there yeah. for, for, uh, for them to come out really. Uh, we have to take a few, uh, few more calls. We have a number of people on the, on the line. So uh, hello, what's your name please and where are you calling from? Uh, hello, as alaikum. Well, uh, my name is Ali Hassan. I'm calling from Birmingham. Uh, hello. Hello, yes, uh, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, I really, I was flicking through the channel and, and came up uh, with your particular program. Yes. Uh, what I wanted to do is congratulate the brother who is uh, currently doing research into uh, the history of Bangladeshis who uh, uh, entered into pioneering uh, activities such as uh, opening up restaurants and various other businesses. Mm -hmm. I really congratulate him mm -hmm. because uh, the things that he talked about uh, going back to forefathers who arrived in this country, and I'm sure he'll cover it, uh, it goes back to even 1940. For example, my own grandfather who came in 1940 from mm -hmm. uh, 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 following the British War, mm -hmm. you know, in the 40s. So it is true, quite often I do talk about all the, the struggles that they have, and there are books. There is one book which I read briefly across 13 rivers or seven seas and 13 rivers, which actually really, really describes about the Bangladeshis' tough time that they had from the moment they left their own villages. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, sorry, yeah. I, uh, I can't hear uh, mm -hmm. any responses. That's why I am. Yeah, no, uh, we are, we are, we are the issue is, yeah, I've read briefly about it, and it was quite uh, 
uh, tearful for me to read that particular book. The struggle they've had, um, people from very, very, you know, far rural villages who came to uh, India, Calcutta, and then moved on to the uh, ship and then went around the world, and then they uh, eventually ended up in Britain, many of them. Yeah. And, and, and it is their hard work, dedication, and devotion which has given us yeah. or put us in a better stead yeah. and do well. Yeah. And it is absolutely right, the brother said, they need, okay. future generations need to know uh, where our roots are, how we came yeah. about in this country. We just didn't fly from, you know, okay. in a plane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you, sir, very much for your call. Uh, we've got a few... Uh, can I just, add, just yeah, comment on that quickly? Yeah. The brother who just phoned in just now, I, I really... I'm, 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 it's heartwarming that people are ringing in with mm -hmm. such enthusiasm. People like that, I'd love for them to keep their details. Mm -hmm. He mentioned about his grandfather, pioneers like his grandfather. These are the stories I want to capture. They might have okay. old documents, photographs. Okay. So any, any people who are okay. calling in, please you leave your number if you okay. have a story. That's to, fine. To uh, we, can, we can take those numbers. We have to take another call. We have a number of people on the line, actually. So we'll take another call. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from, please? Hello. Hello there. Hi there, my name, is, my name is Manny from Birmingham. Oh, hi, Manny. Hi there, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on the air? Yes, you're on the air, yeah, we can hear okay, you. Okay, fantastic. I'm just calling to, uh, to, to congratulate um, Brother Muhammad for this uh, incredible project of, uh, you know, the revival uh, and understanding of Bangladeshi uh, restaurants. I mean, as a, as a, as a Sikh-born lad myself, I wasn't aware that Bangladeshi mm -hmm. uh, restaurant was such a big heritage in the UK and where, uh, where Bangladeshi food started. I just wanted to ask what the, um, what the dates uh, of, the, of, the, of the event and the exhibition will be uh, on, on when they're coming on. just wanted to ask uh, okay. Mohammed when that's happening and where it will be, please. Okay. Yeah, uh, we will. Uh, we, will, we will basically. Will uh, w this will be promoted later on? Uh, but I, I think we got. We have another call. Uh, hello, uh, where are you calling from, please? And what's your name? Uh, hello there. Uh, where are you calling from? I'm from North London. Hello there. Welcome to the show. What would you like to say, please? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. What would you like to say? Okay. Um, I really like the program and the mm -hmm. initiative is really good. Thank you. Uh, I came into this country in 1972. Mm -hmm. And um, when I came in, the, um, I live with a family who had a restaurant. And I've seen the women, they have sacrificed so much because they hardly see their husbands. <laughs> and uh, children as well, because it was such a hard work. Mm -hmm. Started from say, 10 o'clock in the morning and uh, finished at 2 o'clock at night. And um, I was really surprised that uh, uh, people can <laughs> do that much hard work. And I really admire those people because of people who work so hard. You people are sitting here. Yes, and I'm really proud that uh, they have put you people in this position. Indeed, indeed. Because of their hard work. Of course, you, you are doing, uh, uh, you are working hard as well. Mm -hmm. And that's why you, are, you came into this The foundation has been laid by our uh, forefathers uh, here and, and, and the hard work that they've done. That's why we see the fruits of this hard work. Thank you very much for your uh, important call and sharing with us uh, your, uh, your journey as well. Um, I think we, we're going to be going to a break uh, uh, in, in about two minutes. But before we go to a break, I want to come back to uh, Naz uh, uh, Nazreen. You spoke about the, the challenges. I mean. Um, is there any particular thing that, that hinders, uh, for example, is a, a, if a, a daughter-in-law, for example, wants to pursue a, a PhD or a further education, um, uh, what, what can she do? What steps can she take to take that forward? Um, I am a daughter-in-law who is okay. pursuing a PhD, so I feel like I can really relate to this question. Okay. I think if you get your family um, support and your network okay. Um, sorted by network. I mean, people who know what you're doing, the struggles. I mean, I've got a PhD um, assignment <coughs> due in tomorrow, and mm. my family have seen me struggling for the past week, just trying to 
make time for it as well as volunteering and everything else. Um, I've got an incredibly supportive husband mm -hmm. and amazing in-laws who are aware of exactly how hard p mm -hmm. um, a PhD is and how difficult um, my life is at the moment even though I am enjoying it and mm -hmm. I chose to put myself in this position but I think just making sure that you've got the support of your family and friends so if you are struggling you know that you've got someone you can go to mm -hmm. and I think the biggest challenge is confidence mm -hmm. there's so many women within our community that just don't believe in themselves mm -hmm. and I was one of them um, I actually didn't want to come on this show because I was so nervous and confident and it was my parents that said no this is something good you know you can make a difference so here I am but right. confidence is just one of those things that mm. it takes time to develop it takes time to grow but unless you try unless you you know speak to your family about it or you know go out of your own way to try and make things happen how will you know okay it's, it's, it's very very inspirational what you're saying and I think this is what we want from 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 our community but we have to go for another break now so uh we will be back uh back uh in a few minutes uh but when we come back we'll be talking to our guests about the future of our community uh, specifically uh, specifically about the future of our young people uh in our community so please join us back